In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. So on this Treasure Sunday, or this first Sunday of Lent, we heard in the Gospel where we should lay our treasure in heaven, because this is what our destination is. And then it talks about trusting God for our basic needs and not having anxiety for tomorrow. I want to extend that concept today in our sermon about trusting God even in times of adversity. Because the truth is all of us face some kind of distress in our lives. Some more than others. It could be the heartache of a failing marriage or a miscarriage or having a child who's rebellious or the anxiety of the breadwinner in the family losing his job or the despair of someone falling in a terminal illness or there's injustice in the world and we feel like it's unfair some people are painfully lonely others have unexpected grief and still others are humiliated by rejection they don't feel like they can fit in some people get a demotion at work so there's a lot of despair in the world a lot of difficult circumstances and this contributes to our anxiety and this contributes to our emotional pain and we experience it at various times and at different degrees sometimes it's sudden and traumatic other times it's persistent and chronic We'll read in the paper or in the press some things that are even on a grander scale. Like we'll hear about wars, or terrorism, or famine, earthquakes, racial tension, murder, the pandemic now of uh, the, the spread of the coronavirus that ha has people up in arms. So a lot of times we find ourselves feeling helpless and feeling worried, fearful, and not knowing where to turn. The threat of a nuclear holocaust, for example. Even the Christian himself begins to ask the question. Not, not the unbelievers. The Christian begins to ask, the where is God? Doesn't he care about the thousands who have died, for example? Doesn't he care about innocent civilians? Doesn't he care about the pedestrian who was struck by a, uh, a drunk driver? Even on a smaller scale, we live our lives that are full of, full of anxiety. Like for example, we can schedule a vacation and then we have to cancel it because someone falls sick. Or something at home breaks down like the, the water heater or the, the, lo the, the washing machine or you have an exam the next day and you lose your notes. You know, something like, something that always seems to happen. And it's gonna to continue to happen. Life is full of these little tragedies, right? They're mundane, some of them are mundane and they're temporary, but they begin to add up and it causes disappointment in our life and we begin to fret. We begin to fume. We begin to be anxious. The problem is we don't know what the future holds. We don't see the future. And the fear of the unknown is what gets us most of the time. Solomon the Wise says, we don't know what a day may bring forth. We just don't, because we don't see the future. There's someone who described life as having a thick curtain hung across your path as you're walking. A thick curtain in front of you as you're walking. And that curtain begins to recede a little by little as we advance in life, but only step by step. If you stop, the curtain doesn't move. If you begin to move, it begins to recede a little bit. None of us can tell what's beyond that curtain, not even for a single day or even an hour or a minute. So these kinds of events, they begin to unfold in ways that are, that are contrary to our expectation. That are some things that we don't expect, some things that we don't want in our lives. And they fill us with heartache and grief and frustration. 
And what's also worse is that it seems that God's people are not immune from such pain. In fact, it seems that God's people fall into more severe and more frequent times of distress than the unbeliever. Seems that way. But I'll direct you back to the scripture. In the book of Psalms, and King David says, many are the tribulations of the righteous, but the Lord will deliver them out of them all. Many of the tribulations are of the sinners? No, of the righteous, but the Lord will deliver them out of them all. But where is God in all of this? Can we really trust God when adversity strikes, when life begins to be painful? Does he, as the scripture promises us, does he come to the rescue of those who seek him? Does he deliver those who call upon him in the day of trouble? Can you trust God? When I ask you that question, can you trust God? That's a twofold question. Can you trust God? The first meaning is, is God dependable in times of affliction? That's the first meaning. The second meaning is, emphasize the word you. Can you trust God? Can you trust God? Do you have a relationship with God and confidence in Him that you believe in Him even in times of trial, even when you don't see evidence of his presence or his power at the time. Can you trust God? So number one, is God dependable? Number two, are you able to trust him? It's not easy to trust God in times of pain. No one enjoys pain. Everybody wants pain to be re relieved quickly. St. Paul himself pleaded with God three times to take away the thorn in his flesh, and he finally found God's grace to be sufficient for him. Joseph of the Old Testament was pleading with the Pharaoh's cupbearer to let him out of prison, right? St. Paul writes, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. And that's true. In fact, if you read Solomon, the wise says to us, Consider what God has done. Who can straighten what he has made crooked? In other words, sometimes God allows crooked things to happen. Allows crooked things to happen. If he allows it, then he's also the one who can straighten out the crook. I want to ask a question even further. Not only can you trust God, but can you encourage others to trust him? faithfully during their emotional pain is the whole idea of trust trusting God is it just a Christian expression you know how here in our community we have a lot of expressions and we say them without meaning I feel like we say them without thought right thank God but it's just something we say or I don't know what that means. But we say it. Alhamdulillah. It's expressions that we hear all the time in our community, but do we mean them? Do we mean them? So is this one of them? I trust God. I have faith in God. There's going to be distress. There's going to be despair. There's going to be darkness that fills our souls. And we wonder, does God care? Or does God have more important things to worry about. It's more difficult to trust God than it is to obey Him. I'll say it again. It's more difficult to trust Him than to obey Him because the will of God is given to us in the Bible and it's reasonable. But the, the circumstances that we find ourselves in are not reasonable. They're irrational. And we can't make meaning of them sometimes. The, in other words, the law of God is recognized for us in the Scripture. But the circumstances of our lives, they appear to be dreadful. They're grim, they're tragic, calamitous. So obeying God is worked out within parameters, well-defined boundaries. But trusting God is in an arena that has no boundaries. Because we don't know the extent or the duration or the frequency of the painful experience that we're enduring. We don't know how severe it's gonna be or how long it's going to take. So it's boundless. 
but it's just as important to trust God as it is to obey God. When we disobey God, we defy His authority. We despise His holiness. But when we fail to trust Him, we doubt His sovereignty. We question His goodness if we don't trust Him. In both cases, we doubt His majesty and His character. You know, the people of Israel, when they became hungry, look at what they said or what it says in the scripture. They spoke against God saying, can God spread a table in the desert? Can he supply meat for his people? Look at their questioning. And then a few verses later, when the Lord heard them, he was angry for they did not believe in God or trust in his salvation. They did not believe in God or trust in his salvation. In order for us to trust God, we have to view our adverse circumstances through the eyes of faith and not through the eyes of sense, because it's not going to make sense to us. Our reasoning is flawed. Our reasoning is limited. But when it comes to the incomprehensible, he has a different plan that maybe we haven't figured out yet. And the faith to trust in God during adversity comes from the Word of God, comes from the Scripture. It's only in the Scripture that we find an adequate view of God's relationship with us and His involvement in our lives during painful circumstances. The Scriptures t uh, teach us three essential truths about God. I want you to remember these truths. Number one, I'm going to ask you at the end. Number one, God is completely sovereign. And if you don't know what sovereign means, go home and look it up. It means he's in control, he's the ruler, he governs. He is in complete sovereignty. That's number one. Number two, God is infinite in his wisdom. And number three, God is perfect in his love. So he is sovereign, he is wisdom, and he is love. Can you remember those three? The sovereignty of God is asserted in the scripture, probably on every page of the scripture. Look at what Jeremiah says in his Lamentations. Who can speak and have it happen if the Lord has not decreed it? Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both calamities and good things come? Is it not from the Most High that calamities and good things come from the same source? Some people are offended by this verse. They find it diff difficult to accept that both calamity and good things come from God. They say, well, if, if he's a God of love, then how could he allow calamity? Well, our Lord Jesus Christ affirmed God's sovereignty in calamity when he confronted Pontius Pilate. And Pilate said to him, don't you realize that I have the power either to free you or to crucify you? And what was our Lord's response? You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. So even the evil that is inside of you to do evil, it's only allowed by God's providence, by God's sovereignty. For our Lord Jesus Christ was acknowledging God's sovereignty, his sovereign control over his life. Now, because God sacrificed His only begotten Son for our sins in such an amazing act of love, we tend to overlook the fact that Christ experienced excruciating pain. We see it as an act of love, which is the epitome of love, the perfect sacrifice. But He experienced an unimaginable level of calamity to the extent that He was saying, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. But he didn't waver in his assertion of God's sovereign control. And that's why he said, nevertheless, not my will, but according to your will. So rather than being offended by the Bible's assertion of God's sovereignty in both good and in calamity, believers should be comforted by it. That we may be sure that our Father has a loving purpose in it. Look at what King Hezekiah said. He says, surely it, was, surely it was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish. 
It was for my benefit that I suffered anguish. You see, God does not exercise his sovereignty haphazardly in a wishy-washy way, but only in such a way as his infinite love deems fit for us. Again, Jeremiah says, Though he brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love, for he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to the children of men. Huh? He does not willingly bring affliction or grief to the children of men, but it's for our sake. It's because we are in need of it. God's sovereignty is exercised in his perfect and infinite wisdom far beyond what we can understand. St. Paul bows down before the mystery of God and he says, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. So God's purpose, God's plan, God's path is beyond what we can understand. So St. Paul acknowledged what we must acknowledge if we are to trust God. So our primary purpose then is to be convinced of these truths that we appropriate in our daily circumstances. What are the truths? Number one, God is sovereign. Number two, God is infinite in his wisdom. Number three, God is perfect in his love. It doesn't matter whether our pain is trivial or traumatic. It doesn't matter whether our pain is temporary or it seems to be forever. Regardless of the nature of the circumstances, we must learn to trust God if we are to glorify Him in the right way. And in order for us to trust God, we must know Him, we must know him in an intimate and personal way. King David writes in Psalm 9, Those who know your name will trust in you, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Those who know your name will trust you, for you, O Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. So to, go, so to know God's name is, is to know Him in an intimate and personal way. And it's more than just knowing about God, facts about God. It's coming into a deeper personal relationship with Him as a result of seeking Him even in the midst of turmoil. May our Lord Jesus Christ give us the strength to endure trying times so that we can learn to trust God. And by the way, the excerpts that I was presenting to you today is from a book called Trusting God by a Christian author. His name is Jerry Bridges. If you ever pick up the book Trusting God, I think it's a wonderful one, especially if you feel like you're experiencing difficulty in your life that just don't seem to go away. May the Lord give us the strength and the wisdom to understand His will and how much He is forming us and fashioning us for our salvation, which is needed to the glory of His holy name. Glory be to God forever. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be.